appreciate the invitation. And uh, indeed, the, 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 the title is water, but really the main subject is light, um, light and water. And um, you already stole my thunder. <laughs> uh, in, in speaking of the fact that not everything about water is known. And I want to start just by providing, um, by providing a few examples. Okay, so this is, a, this is something that you see all the time. You see a cloud. And, um, you know, sometimes the clouds can uh, appear. Um, uh, if you have, for example, a uh, vast array of water, sometimes you see only one cloud just above. And the question is, well, how come, how come you see only one cloud when the water is evaporating all over? You don't always see one cloud, but you see it often enough. Maybe you've never thought about this uh, particular uh, aspect of, uh, of water. And another one, a related one, is, well, you know, this cloud consists of little droplets of water. Droplets are heavier than air. How come the cloud doesn't fall on your head? Something that you uh, perhaps haven't thought about. Now here's another anomaly uh, uh, <coughs> to demonstrate that we really don't understand water. These are droplets of water floating on water. Now, you don't expect droplets to float. And um, so what's the explanation for this? And <coughs> excuse me, I'm just trying to illustrate that although you may think you know everything there is to know about water, there's just a couple of examples of what I think you don't know. And here's another one. This is a so-called water bridge. It's not our work, but the work of Elmar Fuchs mostly, although we've duplicated it. You take two beakers and you put them rim to rim, filled with water, and then put two electrodes in and put on a high voltage. So what happens? is shown here. So a bridge forms between the two. And that's not so spectacular. But if you move one of the beakers away from the other, the bridge persists. And it persists essentially indefinitely. And the distance be between the two can extend to as much as four centimeters. So, um, so what's the explanation? Anybody knows? I know one or two of you know, but uh, besides them, so I'm, I'm, I'm just presenting these to illustrate to you that although you think you know about water, really you don't know because if you did know, you'd be able to explain all this. Okay, so we, uh, we got interested in, in water uh, about 15 years ago when I wrote this book. And the book was actually designed to illustrate the ideas of a, a neglected scientist. His name is Gilbert Ling. He's 96 years old and came from China many years ago. And he had the idea that water inside the cell was not just like this kind of water, but it was organized in a way that the, the water molecules were actually ordered and lined up. And we got terribly interested in this. And I thought an interesting idea would be to write about it. And, and that's what this book is about. But it went way beyond. And the book discussed the role of water in cell biology. And to summarize, if you don't know the role of water in cell biology, you don't know cell biology because water is absolutely central. Although you wouldn't know it if you read a standard cell biology book where you'd have trouble finding the word water even in the index. Um, now, one, one of the features of this was that, well, the cells are crowded with macromolecules, especially proteins. And essentially, every water molecule is not very far from the surface of one of these proteins. So, so all of the water is interfacial in nature. And the idea was that, that uh, the water molecules shown here as simple dipoles are, because of the charges on the surface, are lined up at least for a few molecular layers. And when you go farther than that, we don't know how far. We didn't know how far. Then because of the, the natural so-called thermal motion or Brownian motion, the order tends gradually to disappear. One of the main features of this was that this kind of water being like a crystal almost, this ordered water, uh, tends to exclude solutes and particles. Uh, just like ice, for example, when ice forms, it's a, it's a pure crystal. And it pushes out everything else as it forms. This water ha has similar properties. Anyway, that's where we started. And we really were curious to find out more about the properties of this water, because it seems so interesting. 
Um, and uh, so we came upon a preparation where we could study this. And it, it's very simple. It starts with a, a gel. You see here, uh, virtually any gel made of water would do. And it's sitting next to, the gel is sitting in a chamber next to water. And in this water, we put some particles. We actually use microspheres, little, little spheres. And, and we notice that uh, there is a region here where these particles are excluded. And so we thought, hmm, this is interesting because maybe this zone here where they're excluded corresponds to this region of ordered water. And if so, then we have something that we can use to study uh, what's, what's happening. Well, the situation was actually somewhat more dramatic than that. You can see that as this region grew, it pushed out, excluded all of these, these spheres. And we began seeing this again and again. And once they're excluded, they continue to undergo this kind of random motion, but they never enter back into this zone. And so we began to see this exclusion again and again. And someone suggested that we give it a name. And so we called it, for obvious reasons, the, reasons, the exclusion zone, or EZ. Now, I know in Europe, that doesn't work. It's EZ. But, so, but we thought, you know, this is easy to remember. So <laughs> it kind of stuck, although I must tell you, this is not the most appropriate name for this. We saw, we saw this um, <coughs> in other preparations as well. What you see here is a piece of naphion. Most of you have never heard of naphion, but naphion is a polymer. It's a bit like Teflon, but with charge groups. It comes in a thin sheet. So from this thin sheet, we cut out whatever shape we like. This is an arrowhead. We put it in the chamber. We pour in the water with the microspheres, and this is what happens. Same thing. This exclusion zone grows. And here, the exclusion zone grows so large, I cut it off prematurely, it grows to about almost half a millimeter. It's so big that you don't really need the microscope. We use the microscope here. You don't need a microscope to see it. You can see it with your naked eye. So, so this basic finding has been confirmed by many people uh, by now. And actually, it was confirmed in 1970 in a paper written in the Journal of Physiology, unbeknownst to us, but we, we found it. So there's no question about the existence of this phenomenon. The question is, what does it mean? And that's what I want to talk about. So <coughs> I want to answer uh, five questions. Is this phenomenon general, or just those two cases that I mentioned? Does it really arise from the ordering of water? Because if so, it means a lot of water molecules this is a huge, um, um, huge amount of, of exclusion zone. Can water ordering explain? <coughs> I'm sorry. Can it explain those first three slides that I showed, which you couldn't explain so easily? And in order to create order, you need energy. Uh, and where does the energy come from? Uh, it's like. It's like, for example, you know, your room gets dirty, messy very easily, but if you want to get it straightened out, you have to put in a lot of energy to do it, get it back to, to being ordered. So it's kind of, kind of the same here with the molecules. You've got to put in energy to order those water molecules. So, so where, does that, where does that come from? And of course, that's the connection I want to talk about today with, with you. Uh, and might these findings apply broadly? OK, so question one, generality. We tried, just to summarize, we tried numerous gels, various polymers, biological surface, and, and monolayers, that is, single molecular layers uh, on, on gold. And we found uh, that this is quite general. As long as the surface is hydrophilic, that is, if you put a droplet of water on the surface, the water spreads out instead of beating, it, beating up as it would do on Teflon or something hydrophobic. So hydrophilic surfaces do this always. And what's excluded from the exclusion zone? We found uh, that uh, we studied from big particles to small particles to big molecules to small molecules. We studied them down to molecular weight roughly 100. And they're uniformly excluded. Even salts, common salts, appear to be excluded, although the evidence for that is not as conclusive as for the others. And I want to give you just a couple of examples. And one example is something that 
I think you, you all have some experience with from your student days. You remember litmus paper? You stick the litmus paper in, it turns color. Well, the chemicals from the litmus paper come in, in powder in soluble form. You can put them in and they still change color in the same way. So, so we put some of this into water. Now, the, this is a combination of chemicals, molecular weight, approximately 100 or so. And the question is, are these chemicals excluded from the exclusion zone? And if so, if they are excluded, then we know that, that substances molecular weight 100 or so are excluded. So here's a, a, a result. And at the bottom, whoops, it's not so clear because of the light, but I can tell you that this is actually quite beautiful if, if um, in the absence of light. But since this is a light conference, I suppose we need <laughs> at all costs have light, but okay. But the, the main point, so here um, we have this naphion that I mentioned to you, and this is just water and all those dyes. And you can see these really nice colors here, but you can see no color here in the exclusion zone, which means that the dye molecules are excluded and they're molecular weight 100. So, so that speaks to, to the topic that I, I mentioned. However, even more interesting is the color distribution because the red color corresponds to a high concentration of protons, pH 3 or less. So I'll come back to that because this is critically important and fewer and fewer as you see here. But it's nice, you know, you could put it up on your wall as a, as a pretty painting or picture, what have you. And I just want to illustrate recently an, another experiment. Some of you know about chia seed. Uh, okay, so, so we tried chia because we thought it has such remarkable hydration properties. We wondered whether it too shows this kind of exclusion. And uh, you can see here's the seed and here's a droplet of water containing a blue dye. It's Evans blue dye and you can see the clear zone around, around the seed which is actually quite big. So it has an enormous capacity to, to generate this kind of uh, exclusion zone. So just to summarize because I don't want to spend too much time on this. Uh, many hydrophilic surfaces generate exclusion zones. It's sort of a maybe almost definitional. And many solutes are excluded. So that's the first question. Second question is, is this zone really different from ordinary water? Okay, so I've alluded to the possibility that it might be different, but I haven't presented to you any, any evidence for that. So I'm not going to go over the evidence in huge detail because it's published, almost all of it is published, and because I want to get to more interesting stuff. Let me just list it for you. Um, the easy water molecules are more constrained than ordinary water molecules. That's the NMR technique. Uh, the molecules are more stable than bulk water. Uh, the easy has a negative charge, and I will show you that experiment because I think it's the most central of all, all of the experiments. You expect water to be neutral. This is not neutral, it has a negative charge. It absorbs light at, in the UV range at 270 nanometers, which I think is, is also quite important. It's more viscous than bulk water by several orders of magnitude. The molecules here are aligned. They're not random as in ordinary H2O. Uh, the molecular structure is different, and the optical properties are also different. And this is actually was done by, by two Russians from Moscow who didn't know each other. One passed uh, recently, and one used a biological model, the other one used a polymeric model. They got the same result. That is, the refractive index was 1.1 uh, or 10 or 11 percent higher than the refractive index of ordinary water probably because of higher density. So these are some, there are a couple more and I just haven't bothered to list them. And I want to talk about number three because this one is, I think, really important. So how did we do this measurement of negative electrical potential? Um, we took uh, a gel to start with. This is a polyacrylic acid gel. Here's the inside of the gel. This would be the interfacial region here. And we wanted to measure the electrical properties, see if there's any charge in this zone. And the way we did it was we took two electrodes. They're actually micro electrodes. Uh, they come to a fine, very fine tip. And we put one electrode out here somewhere in, in the fluid as a reference electrode. And the probe electrode we put here. And we moved it from here to here to here at different points. And you can see that if the probe electrode is 
a pretty big distance from the interface between the gel and the water, the electrical potential difference between here and here is zero. That's good. <laughs> That's what we expect. The unexpected uh, was that as we got closer and worked our way into this region of the exclusion zone uh, here, the electrical potential went down to minus, as, as, as negative as minus 120 or so millivolts. So, so it looked as though this, this region has negative charge. So we decided, after this was repeated a day later by a Russian group who was equally uh, curious, we communicated with them and they got the same result. We tried it with a, uh, a different, we tried it with naphion. So we got rid of the polyacrylic acid gel and we put a piece of naphion here and we did the same experiment. And you can see the result is rather similar, uh, but quantitatively it differs. The, the region of negativity starts pretty far from the interface and it gets more negative, you see. So it, again, it sort of corresponds roughly with the exclusion zone, now that is wherever there's an exclusion zone, you get negative potential, same here and same here. So it looks like the exclusion zone is negatively charged. That doesn't make any sense, because think about the experiment. Um, you know, I'm taking water, neutral water, and I'm pouring it into the chamber, right, next to a gel or next to a polymer, and it turns out that this vast region becomes negatively charged. How is that possible? Well, the only way it might make sense is if the water molecules are somehow splitting into uh, some negative zone and, and positive zone. So, so, and if that's occurring, I mean many water molecules, if that's occurring, you might expect some positive charges corresponding to these negative ones out somewhere out here. But is there any evidence for those positive charges? And the answer is that you've already seen the evidence in, in this pretty slide. I turned it 90 degrees to correspond with the previous one. So remember, the exclusion zone I showed you has negative charge. And here, you got positive charge from all the, the protons. So it really does look as though it's possible that the water molecules have split so that you get negative here and positive here. And we, you know, we thought that was the case, and we just really wanted to make sure because this is kind of significant. So we put one electrode in here in the negative and one electrode in the positive and connected them through a resistor. So we should get current flow from the positive to the negative, just like you'd get current flow from a battery. And here is the result. This is current as a function of time. And you can see it starts pretty big. It goes down. But it doesn't go to zero. It goes to some uh, plateau that persists. So it means that we really do have charge separation in, in water. And uh, basically, it looks something like this. We have a, what amounts to uh, see a hydrophilic surface here, water. This exclusion zone is negatively charged. And the ordinary water beyond is positively charged. So, so we have a battery. So uh, the main point of this was that the EZ region has negative charge. Okay. If, we, if we look at. We want to know something about the structure of this. The first thing we notice is if you look at the blue ones, the molecules in the EZ are aligned, and they're stable and constrained. So, so what does this correspond to? Well, it corresponds actually to a liquid crystal. And those of you who know liquid crystals will know that this is a kind of characteristic. And I'll, I'll, I'll go into that a bit more, because there's a lot to say about this liquid crystal. But so far, the summary is that we have some region of water next to hydrophilic surfaces that's some kind of liquid crystal, uh, maybe water molecules organized in some way. It has negative charge. It's not neutral. Very important. It excludes solutes profoundly. It may be non-dipolar. These dipoles may not be a good representation because of some of the evidence that I've already suggested. I'll go back to that in a moment. And it may extend very far. So, um, so here it shows four or five molecular layers. And if the evidence I've shown you is correct, we're talking four or five million molecular layers, not four or five layers. So it's very significant, and there could be a lot of it. It was suggested just over 100 years ago by a famous physical chem or colloid chemist, 
um, Sir William Hardy. He must be important because he's got Sir before his name. So, I mean, I guess that qualifies for something. Anyway, he said that based on the known properties of water, 100 years ago, three phases won't do it. There must be a fourth phase. And so I'm not sure if what we've found qualifies as the fourth phase. It, certainly is bounded, as you'd expect, from phases, and the structure is different. So perhaps it is the long lost fourth phase of water. And you know, uh, there's, a, there's actually a huge amount of evidence for this, evidence that's been forgotten. I apologize for the quality of this, but this is 1949, okay, from a, a guy at Stanford University. And he wrote a review article saying, what happens when, you, when a liquid meets a surface, okay? And it's not just water he's talking about, but other liquids too. And he cites more than 100 references, actually closer to 200, that evidence for the fact that when a liquid meets a surface, there's a profound change, not just water, but others. And he points out uh, hundreds of microns in depth. So depth means width, we, we call it width. And, Surface zone is the same as the zone I've been talking about. So this is not new at all. Everything I've been telling you has been known for 100 years, almost. Recently, an Italian group from Naples tried to solidify this kind of uh, water, of easy water, and he succeeded. And this is a, an, an example of how he did this. So this is, you might say, solid water at room temperature. If you gather this thin film, you can feel it in your fingers, and uh, so we brought home some of this stuff. This is solid water at room temperature. Amazing. <laughs> okay, so, um, so, so summary so far um, is all of this, and, and I wanna now ask the question, are these dipoles really a, the, an adequate representation of what we have? In my previous book, I suggested such, and many people have suggested such, but. But I think it's not. I think it's wrong, <laughs> despite the fact that we thought it was right. <laughs> you know, it's the way it goes. <laughs> uh, and, and so why, why do I think so? What's wrong with that? Well, it's very simple. You see, uh, dipoles are neutral. This zone has negative charge. So you, you can stack neutral dipoles you know, from here to Moscow or wherever or to the moon, and you'll never get negative charge out of this. You'll get neutral. So we got a problem. So it's wrong, and, uh, unfortunately. And, and another point is that this 270 nanometer absorption is not characteristic of dipoles. My chemistry friends are not shy to tell me that. It's impossible. So, so it's more characteristic of ring-like structures. So we began thinking about, well, if this is not simply stacked dipoles, what is it? Now, I don't know how you would approach this, but we were confused. We didn't know where to go. And we thought one, one way to go is to start with precedent. If you have um, some form of water whose structure you know, maybe a variant on that structure could be what we're looking for. So, so we're looking for some kind of precedent in water. Now, if you, what structure of water do we really know? Well, certainly not vapor, because that's and liquid water is totally confusing. The stuff that's in this glass, if you look in the literature and try to find out the structure, you'll find a dozen different theories about what the structure may be. However, we know the structure of ice, because ice is a crystal. You can do x-ray diffraction. You could learn all about the structure of the crystal. So we thought, let's start with ice. And this is not ice, but suppose maybe some kind of variant on the structure of ice could be a way to go. So, uh, this is what ice looks like, and uh, the, the red ones are oxygens. I've omitted the hydrogens, which would be halfway between each pair of oxygens, just to keep, keep it clear. So you notice a few things. The first is that it's a sheet-like structure, right? And the second, it's, um, it's built of hexagons, um, so it's a honeycomb. And uh, what else? They're in register here, and if you look at the same structure at a different angle, then this is what it looks like. You, no longer can you recognize the nice hexagons but because of the angle, but you can recognize these blue dots. Obviously, they're not really blue, but so what, what are the blue dots? The blue dots are protons. 
so linking the two negative oxygens is, is a positive proton, it's a kind of glue, and that's why ice is hard because of that. So we thought, could we start with this structure somehow, and, and maybe some modification of that structure is what we need to, to explain this exclusion zone. So we thought, um, if we just remove the protons, get rid of these blue dots here, then we start with a, with a neutral substance, and, and then since we remove positive, we get negative charge, is what we need, and it's not solid anymore because you're removing the glue. So we thought, here's a good idea. We thought we nailed it until someone tapped me on the shoulder and said, you know, there's a minor problem, it can't exist. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, he said, well, what happens is you remove this and you get negative next to negative, right? They repel each other so the whole structure will fly apart. So after a few weeks of antidepressants, <laughs> uh, not really, <laughs> um, we, we came upon another idea that we thought, this works. <laughs> it just seems. And uh, so what I've done now is, is I've simply shifted one plane relative to another plane. And you can see what happens. So the back plane is, is, uh, is light, and the plane closest to you is darker. And you can see that, that just by shifting in this direction by half of the oxygen to oxygen distance, it's, you get something nice, because now the negative oxygen is sitting next to a positive hydrogen. Uh, and you see, and they attract each other electrostatically. It's not just at one point, but you can see many, actually, it's one third of the oxygens that are linked this way. So they're stuck together. So this can exist, it's stable, quasi-stable. You can exert, exert shear and destroy the stability and get flow, but it's quasi-stable. So we thought, this is a good, good idea. It seems, seems to work. And, and, uh, and so the idea is that you have some uh, hydrophilic material next to water, and from the water, uh, you create these layers of EZ that look like this. Remember, they're, each one is shifted relative to the one before. So there, there's actually not much space to crawl through this uh, because the holes are, are very small. And so they build and they build from, from the water. And so a given plane then looks something like this where you have the oxygens. And I put now restored the hydrogens here. You can see it. And uh, so this looks like um, a reasonable candidate for a structure, and, but it's not H2O. If you count the number of oxygens and hydrogens in one unit cell, it's not two to one. It's actually three to two. So this substance is H3O2. And by the way, I told you that this was solidified, and the people who solidified it found H3O2. So it's kind of cool. Now, so. What I've, what I've done is to shift this layer this way relative to this layer, and then things lined up very nicely, and it sticks together. But I didn't have to shift to the right. I could have shifted to the left. I could have, because it's symmetrical, I could have shifted 60 degrees or 120 degrees. And, and, and what does this give us? Well, this gives us interesting structural possibilities because so here's, here's the zero layer, and this is shifted zero degrees, 60 degrees, 120 degrees, et cetera, and you get a helix. So why is a helix interesting? Um, a helix is interesting because in biology, many substances are helical, right? The DNA, RNA, helical proteins, and it's known that next to these uh, macromolecules lie some kind of structured water. So you can imagine a DNA, for example, sitting right here. So this fulfills that that criterion. So the advantages of this non-dipolar EZ, first of all, it's built on precedent, ice. It's not ice, but it's not so different. It has negative charge, which the experiments demand. The ring-like structures can perhaps delocalize electrons, explain the 270 nanometer light absorption. It's able to accommodate helical structures. And it's a crystal-like structure, which you'd expect that you can pull out, and that's been done. I showed you it can be solidified, which is, I think, very exciting. So the answer to question two about is this easy physically distinct from bulk water, the answer is yes. And the best evidence we have is that it's layered honeycomb structure. OK. So now that we, we have this background, let's move on. 
Um, can this crystalline water explain the first few slides and, and other related anomalies? Where do we get with this? What, what, what do we expect? What kind of behavior do we expect from a crystal? By the way, I probably forget, but I just want to say the three criteria uh, that Anadi was talking about, especially with information. Uh, I'm not going to talk about information or consciousness and such, but this is a three-dimensional structure. It's a crystal, and information can be stored in crystals. And there's good evidence, which I don't have time to get into, that this structure can actually store information. Um, so the first is that crystalline elements stick together. So here, an example is oh, gelatin dessert. Okay, so this is, as you know, uh, if you had the great displeasure of having some of that for dinner last night or something, you know, it's 95% water, and and uh, so. So a question you might ask is, well, it's made of so much water, how come the water just doesn't dribble out? Maybe you never asked that question. I'm not sure, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know. Um, so, so one idea is that, well, it's a solid substance and, you know, it has osmotic pressure. It can pull in water, and that's, that's plausible. However, when I was in Japan, I handled some gels just like this that were not 95% water, but 99.95% water, and they're much the same. So it's kind of hard to say that this little few strands of polymer that sit in the gel are enough to draw in and keep all that water. Something else is, is going on that's responsible. So if you think about a gel and its structure, um, so the, the yellow shows either uh, polymer or proteins that are kind of randomly oriented. And the great big spaces that you see in between are empty, and they're filled with, well, water or, or some other stuff. And so, so your question should be, well, you know, so why doesn't the water just come out, uh, dribble out? And I think the answer is that, is that these crevices are actually filled with EZ water. And, and the reason is that, that this is a hydrophilic surface. And I just showed you what happens to water next to a hydrophilic surface. It forms EZ layers. So all of this water, or certainly most of it, is EZ water. And the EZ water sticks to the surface, and the layers stick to each other. And therefore, the water doesn't come out. And you may ask yourself, um, you know, maybe you had this experience. When you were a kid, you, you, you felt the gel, and you kind of remarked about the unusual nature, the consistency of the gel. You know, why is it gel-like? Well, the water should have exactly that property, a gel-like, highly viscous, uh, just like raw egg white. And I think it's because of the water, certainly not because of the polymers, which is what the textbook will suggest. So here's another phenomenon that you kind of wonder about. This is uh, water, and this is an old Hungarian coin, um, and it floats on the water. So the question is, why does it float? Some of you may have had the experience, you know, you put a pin or put a paper clip on the surface. If you put it beneath the surface, it falls immediately. But if you put it on the surface, carefully, it stays. But it's heavier, more dense than water. So, you know, why does, it, why does that happen? And uh, some of you uh, uh, may think, well, I know the answer to that. It's obviously surface tension. Water has a high surface tension. But if you think about why water is said to have a high surface tension, it has to do with the bonding between water molecules, so the so-called hydrogen bonds. And water likes to hydrogen bond with the next water molecule. But there's a problem at the surface because there's no guy up there to bond to, right? And so, so you got you know, this sort of dangling thing. And the, the thought is, the textbook thought, is that these potential bonds will flip down. And so the top molecular layer of water may have extra, a few extra, of these hydrogen bonds than all the other area, uh, bonds between the water. And, and therefore, the, the top molecular layer should have a higher surface tension. Oh. However, the question is you, that you, you may ask, it, well, is that sufficient to explain the fact that this floats? And we wondered whether it was not sufficient. And so we found that this, uh, that this kind of crystalline water, easy water, fourth phase water grows at the interface between the water and the air. And I think that, that's the explanation. And here's the experiment, which is really simple. You take two glass plates to form a chamber, and they're sealed here to form a little chamber into which you can put water or whatever. So we put water in microspheres, and that's why it's cloudy, because the microspheres uh, scatter light. So here's the air, 
and then here is the meniscus that forms. And we found, remarkably, <laughs> that after you know, 15 or 20 minutes or so, we began to get a clear zone that looked very much like a, an exclusion zone because it excluded microspheres and it was stable for perhaps a day or so. Uh, so there appears to be something uh, going on at the surface. We measured the electrical potential with, mi with microelectrodes and we found it was highly negative. And the next slide will show you that this, this clear zone here is not water. It's actually you know, negative potential, uh, similar to EZ, that it's actually it, it's like a thick gel or like a rubber band. And I'll show you that in the next slide because what we're going to do is we perturb the surface mechanically and you'll see that the thickness of this doesn't change notably. So here's the experiment. It, it's the same picture as before except that we've got this rod on top and the rod is going to perturb the surface. You can see it here and you'll notice that the thickness as it moves back and forth, the thickness of the surface hardly changes as you perturb it. It sticks together just like you'd expect of a, of a gel. And so we think that the reason why the water is able to float paper clips and, and, and stuff like that, heavy, is you get many structure layers that create the surface tension. We're talking uh, about something that is millions of layers, not one layer that's capable of doing it. And that explains, um, some of you may be familiar with this. This is a a Central um, American um, lizard and uh, what the lizard does, it sits on the branch most of the day but then it walks on the water. <laughs> it's called the Jesus Christ lizard because it walks, some of you, yeah, anyway, so there's what this guy does. So, <laughs> you know, it asks you a question whether one molecular layer can do that or whether you need the thick layer that is, is illustrated here. And the same thing happens, <coughs> explains what I showed you before. So you have water sitting on a surface <coughs> and this droplet, this pendant droplet is about to fall on the surface. Now remember, when you have water sitting on the surface, you've got a thick EZ at the top. And when you have a droplet uh, that's about to fall, you also have an EZ around here. So when this drops onto this, it's not H2O hitting H2O, it's EZ hitting EZ, and then you would expect that the dynamics would be, would be different. And so, um, so this is what happens. You can see it stays there and then boom, <laughs> and then boom, it's over. So it, it's, it's five or six dance steps, you might say. And I, I, I don't want to delude you into thinking that we discovered it. This is known for 100 years, it's just that you know, we had a camera, we thought we'd take some more pictures. So, but the explanation, I think, has to do with the fact that it's not water meeting water. It's easy meeting easy. Okay, another thing is that crystals, those of you who have diamonds or rubies, whatever, you know that crystals can be pretty stiff. So if you look at this, um, this water bridge, you know, water doesn't ordinary, this stuff here doesn't do that. It's hard to, to understand. However, if this is some kind of crystalline water, then you can explain the obvious stiffness of this. You can measure the stiffness or compute it based on the length and the droop. There's almost no droop here. It's, it's almost, it looks stiff enough that you can almost walk across it. And I think this is because it's built of some kind of quasi-crystalline water, like EZ water. And finally, in this series, and a really important point, rather than an amusing point, is, is this. So the EZ is negatively charged, right, and the water is positively charged. I showed you that earlier. But you know that if you have positive charges near negative charges, they all want to recombine and annihilate one another. We know that doesn't happen because we stick one electrode here and one electrode here and we measure the electrical potential difference indefinitely. Well, I mean, for a day or so, it changes a little bit, but it doesn't change so much. So these pluses and minuses are kept separated well, how is it that these plus charges don't simply rush into the minus and, and annihilate them? By the way, these are not protons here. Protons combine with water to give you a hydronium ion. And this is, these pluses here are actually hydronium ions. And so the reason uh, that these don't recombine, remember this structure and remember how small these holes are. These holes are extremely small, but the next hole is shifted relative to this one, which makes it much smaller still. 
So these hydronium ions desperately want to invade, but they can't because they can't get into this, uh, this dense network. So, so they stay separated and, and the battery charges remain uh, separated. So the answer to question three is yes. List, liquid crystalline water, or fourth phase, whatever you want to call it, explains many uh, anomalies, and especially why the water battery charges remain separated. Okay, so now here's the critical question, and now we get to something that may be of more interest to you. So what charges the water battery? In order to, to create, sep it's just like, like your cell phone battery, you know, runs down, and you've got to do something about it, so you plug it in if you can find the receptacle. But, you know, this exclusion zone, there's, there's no way to plug it in, you know, so where is it getting the energy? And I think if I had consulted with you people, I would have gotten the answer very quickly, but we couldn't figure out the answer for several years. And one year, uh, a student in the lab, we have many undergraduate students working in the lab as sort of volunteers. He grabbed a lamp that was sitting here, and we had the chamber, and he shined the lamp on the chamber, and we saw something, uh, uh, this is the answer, right? and we saw, this is what we saw. So, um, uh, obviously this is a cartoon, but this is real data. So this is a piece of Nafion, and here's the exclusion zone, and here are the microspheres. So usually it would be quite uniform, but where he shined the lamp, the exclusion zone grew, and it grew enormously. And then if you take away the lamp, it would go back uh, to where it was here with a time constant of, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes or so. So, you know, it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that, you know, if, if he's shining photons and, and this gets bigger, maybe Maybe light is responsible. Maybe the energy for building this comes from light. And so, you know, this was obviously not the only uh, experiment that we did. This was a non-experiment. But we went ahead and we, we uh, managed to study a series of wavelengths from the UV into the infrared and to see how much it would expand. And we found that the greatest expansion was at about three micrometers in, into the infrared. This actually underestimates, for technical reasons, the effect. It's really powerful effect at three micrometers, uh, and that's the wavelength that water absorbs the most. So it looks like the water that's being, the light that's being observed, uh, absorbed is what is being used to create this, this uh, charge separation. And so, so I want to just point out, just emphasize, the most powerful wavelength in growing this is infrared, about three micrometers. So, so where does infrared come from? It's everywhere. Uh, I think you, 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 you know this. If, if you were to, um, to shut all the curtains and turn off the lights and I whip out my infrared camera, I'd get a beautiful image of all of you, you know, your chair and you and, and, um, and your wedding ring and uh, you can see all of it and the, re and the walls. And the reason is that it's all generating infrared energy. It's not just from, say, you know, the red coils on the toaster or the electric range. Everything is generating infrared. It's really hard to get rid of the infrared. This is literally free energy. We don't have to pay for it. It's there all the time. It's hard to get rid of it, in fact. And this is the energy that builds the water, this easy water. And therefore, the energy is there all the time. And therefore, this water is there all the time. You don't need somehow to put extra in. The infrared energy is available all the time. So essentially, what it means is that you have a hydrophilic material next to water. You have easy water that comes from the ambient infrared. If you add additional infrared, it gets bigger. And if you take it away, it will come back to, to where it is. So this is the energy. It's light energy, especially infrared, but other wavelengths work as well that build it. And so, so then, you know, another one of those things that we could never figure out, but now it's obvious. How do you, we've, I've shown you how you can increase the infrared and expand the exclusion zone. And so the question is, well, how do you reduce the infrared? Maybe to reduce, the, the, can you reduce the exclusion zone if you reduce the infrared? So, Dumb as we are, we couldn't figure out how to reduce the infrared. Someone said, well, you know, reduce the temperature to absolute zero. Well, thank you very much. You know, <laughs> that's a great suggestion. And finally, um, it occurred to us 
where I come from in Seattle is the home of Starbucks coffee, okay? And I thought, um, you know, I thought, well, you, you have iced coffee in the summertime, right? And how do you prevent the infrared energy from coming in and warming your iced coffee, right? Well, it's very simple. You, you have a, a gadget that looks like this. So you put your iced coffee in and it stays cold. It prevents the infrared, it blocks the infrared from coming in and warming, warming the, the coffee. And so, so we thought, this is the way to do it. And we didn't use this one, but we used one, uh, a professional doer, they're called, from, from the physics department. It just blocks the infrared because the lining of this thing is a vacuum, and the infrared doesn't penetrate through this vacuum uh, chamber. So we did the experiment, and we start with, with the control. Here's the green, by the way, is just because we use a green filter. It has no other um, significance. So here's a piece of naphion. Here's the EZ in the microspheres, the EZ in the microspheres. This was the original. And then we put it in one of these for 15 minutes. And you can see that it's reduced by you know, roughly a factor of two. And then you take it out, and it comes back. This is 15 minutes. It usually takes about 30 minutes to come back to roughly to, to where it was. And so indeed, uh, we found that if you, if you reduce the, the infrared, then the exclusion zone gets smaller. OK, so the answer to question four about you know, where does the energy come from to build the zone and separate the charges, and we found that it's easy buildup is powered by photonic energy, which orders the water and charges the water battery, something that looks like this. <laughs> you know. OK, so now if you think about, about energy flow around us um, in, you know, on the Earth or uh, elsewhere, so we all know that the sun hits the water, and we can go swimming in the summertime, right? It heats the water. What I've shown you is a different pathway. I've shown you that the light hits the water and imparts energy for building order and separating charge. Okay, it's a different pathway. And we don't know whether this is more important or this is more important, or even the possibility is that there's no arrow here, that the arrow should be here, that the water does this, and this degrades into heat. Not sure. It's possible. OK, so, so I'm suggesting to you uh, that, that light is hitting this water and creating potential energy. But my guess is that there's not one of you who has ever seen this water doing work. If you, if you have energy that's coming into here, the energy has somehow has to get dissipated. Either it blows up because it keeps getting energy, or it does work, right? But I don't think any of you have ever seen this doing work. I'll show you an example that this can do work, OK? Um, and this was a surprise to me. <laughs> and again, it was another student in, in the laboratory. So the student had, was working with naphion tubes originally. And he put the tube in the water. And here in the water, he had microspheres. So he wanted to observe some phenomenon. And he came running into my office, and I almost fell out of my chair when he came and told me that, that there's constant flow through the tube. Now, this seems impossible, because to produce flow through a tube, it's sort of like in your arteries. You know, the heart has to create pressure. And it's a pressure gradient that, that's responsible. And every engineer knows that if you want to pump water through a pipe, you need to put pressure to do it, at least some pressure. You know, and there's no pressure here. Right? So, so I thought, this is really interesting because, because you got flow and it lasted up to a day and a half, just kept going. He says, no matter what I do, the flow keeps going. And of course, we checked for artifacts and such, and we found that this was real. And, and so, um, oops, what happened? <laughs> Upgrade, no, no thanks. OK, so <laughs> the experiment, yes, <laughs> the system, no. So you fill the tube with water, make sure there are no air bubbles. Then you stick it in the chamber, which has spheres in it, you know, so we could see what's going on. And then look at it in the microscope, like this. And what you see is this. You see, so Nafion exclusion zone here. And, and it, you got constant flow. And it just keeps going through. Uh, uh, as I said, it lasts for a really long time. And we know how to make it last, essentially, indefinitely. So we thought, oh, well, we can see this, this funny 
thing in, uh, in tubes of naphion do we see it in other hydrophilic materials. So one student had the bright idea of creating a tunnel in, in a gel. And so it looks something like this. So here you have a polyacrylic acid gel. And the idea is you form the gel with a wire. And you pull out the wire, and you've got a tunnel. Okay, so we take the, the chunk of gel with the tunnel, and we put it into the water and microspheres. And the tunnel quickly fills up with water. You have an exclusion zone here, an exclusion zone here, and all the microspheres are, are gathered in, in the center. And the question is, well, you know, does this behave in the same way as the naphion? Because the situation should be similar. And the answer is a definite yes. You can see it flowing through. So someone said, and we tried, by the way, we tried six or seven different gels with similar results. It's not just this polyacrylic acid gel. Someone said, well, if this thing is being generated, if the energy for this is light, because the chamber, remember, is, is, is absorbing light all the time and building EZ, so that's where the energy is coming from. Um, if you add more light, you should get faster flow. We published recently that we could get up to five times speed increase by shining light on it. So light is definitely creating the energy that drives all of this flow. It's, um, so we, essentially, we have a hollow tube in water. Work is done. So energy is required. You can't get something for nothing. And so what I told you about the energy absorption uh, in the water, that's a necessary condition to, to produce this. So the water is basically, the water, this water is acting as a transducer that transduces light energy into mechanical energy. That's what this experiment shows. Um, now, this seems like maybe a, a surprise <laughs> to, to some of you, but if you think about it, you know, you have a plant that's sitting on your windowsill, so where does it get its energy? Well, you know where it gets its energy, so the light is then transduced and by the way, step one in photosynthesis, you know, is a separation, a breakage of water and separating into plus and minus, which is exactly what I, what I showed you. Uh, it, it, so it takes the light and it converts the light into chemical energy, starting with the separation. That does everything for the plant, metabolism, growth, bending, you name it. And I'm suggesting to you that the same thing occurs in, in water. And it shouldn't be a surprise because um, this is mostly this. You see, so it's no surprise that it happens more or less the same in both. And uh, so we wind up with this equation, and I, I know that is sort of familiar in a way, but um, I know the units don't match, but I think you get what I mean, that uh, this has energy in it, and energy comes from light. So, okay, last question. So why is all of this stuff important? And I think it, it could be foundational for any or all science in, involving water and molecules and light. So in case you're still sleeping from jet lag, this summarizes all that you've missed. <laughs> um, so you have a charged particle or a molecule sitting in water. And what I've tried to demonstrate to you is that surrounding this is this liquid crystalline water, easy, fourth phase, negatively charged, and the corresponding positive charges are s distributed around the water in, in, in uh, hydronium ions here. And all of this is driven by light. Okay. And of course, those of you who have ever read a chemistry book uh, will know that none of this is in the chemistry book. So if we're correct in this, if we're correct, um, then this applies in all aqueous chemical reactions, which means that many uh, <coughs> of the reactions in your chemistry book may need to be the analysis and understanding, may need revision if this is correct. Okay. Now, so here's a question for you, um, um, provocative question. So you have two of these negatively charged entities, one, let's say, taken from my right pocket and one from my left, and you drop the two in a beaker of water, they're near each other, so they can feel one another's charge. And so all of you know the answer to this, I think. What happens to the distance between these? Anybody want to hazard a guess? Right. You think they, yeah. So the answer is that they come together. Surprise. And this is not one of, you know, a crazy idea from our laboratories known for 100 years. And it was addressed even by 
the great physicist Richard Feynman, um, who, who labeled this like, likes, like. So these are like charges, you know, and they like each other. So if you like each other, you come together, right? And so he said, like, likes, like, because of an intermediate of unlikes. So it's not, it doesn't violate any, any principles. It's, it's these positives are drawing these negatives. But the question has always been, well, where do these positives come from? And I've explained to you where they come from. As this gets built up, you get a lot of positives here. And the concentration of them is highest in the middle because you have contributions from this one and from this one. So as a result, these two come together. Um, and this is not a, the idea <laughs> of being apart and coming together. As some of you know the tale of Genji, the first novel ever written. Came, comes from Japan about 1,000 years ago. And the tale of Genji talks of warring parties you know, they will never, ever come together unless the opposite is so like, sorry, sexist, <laughs> like, likes, like, because of an intermediate of unlike. So this is very well known for a thousand years, nothing, nothing new. So they, sorry? The secret of life is not water and light, it's love, <laughs> or vice versa. Okay, so they come together. So when, when do they stop? You know, they stop. You get stability when, when that attractive force, the plus attracting the minus, is equal to the repulsive force of these two repelling each other. Then it's stable. And, and these two will occupy this fixed distance in between. They've come together and they stay that way. They won't meet. Sorry? They won't meet. They won't, yeah, they won't meet. Uh, there are cases in which they will. But so here's an example, not two of them, but here's an entire array uh, of them. And it's known as a colloid crystal. And this is very well studied. And these adopt regular positions. They don't necessarily meet each other. They adopt regular positions because negative charges and positive charges in between. It's stable. The particles stick together. This way they come together because of like, likes, like. This is a good principle of self-assembly. In biology, nobody understands exactly how the different proteins can assemble into uh, larger scale configurations. This is a very simple principle. All you need is light and particles or molecules in water. It happens automatically. And if you think about the origin of life, sometimes I think I was there. <laughs> uh, you think about, so you have the earth and the earth is covered covered with, um, with water, presumably, and some substance, nobody knows what, um, you know, and so the first thing you need to create life is to bring it all together to create a cell or a pre-cell or a gel or something like that. This happens automatically. You just need molecules, water, and light, and they come together just like this. So it may be important. So, and this also, then getting back to the cloud that I said, why, well, how come you, Sometimes you see one cloud when you should see an extensive cloud because the water is, is, is rising everywhere. And I think the answer to that is, looks something like this. Because the cloud, in fact, consists of these aerosol droplets, which are known to be negatively charged. Now, you'd expect that these droplets would never come together because they have the same charge, right? But remember the tale of Genji. So, <laughs> If you have enough positive charges in the environment, and the atmosphere is full of positive charges in variable numbers, depending on conditions, then these positive charges attract these negatives, and they come together to form, form a cloud. And if you have another one of these vesicles, um, uh, aerosol droplets here, this positive charge will attract it. So, so they, you, you can get uh, clusters of clouds with nothing in between. Okay? So now, does biology use radiant energy? Uh, so we absorb, as you, all of you know, uh, we, we absorb light all the time. And so, and, and I'm talking now about natural light, not about the light that some of you use for therapeutic purposes. So the question is, do we make use of this light, or we just radiate it out? You know, plants make use of it, bacteria, single cells make use of it, but it appears that humans don't bother but I think they do, you see. Uh, I think, uh, and I, I'll give you one example, and that is in the cardiovascular system. So I started my career, I gotta admit, doing theoretical modeling of the cardiovascular system. 
and never um, could I imagine that everything that could be known was already known of this. And so, uh, are we okay? Yeah, you're, thank you, yeah, yeah. So, um, so if you, if you think about it, some, I went to Moscow and, and some guys were started to tell me about a problem and, and the problem is in the capillaries. So some of you know that the capillaries are smaller often than the red blood cells that need to pass through the capillaries. So it's kind of like, you know, something seems wrong. It's kind of like designing a toilet with the outlet smaller than the stuff that needs to go through, you know. <laughs> It, so has, has nature really screwed up uh, with this or is something? So, so they, these Russians calculated that if the heart were responsible for pushing the blood through these tiny capillaries, the amount of pressure that would be required is about one million times the pressure that the heart actually can, can develop. So something is wrong and it looks like there's some other energy that may be necessary to help push those red blood cells in the blood through the small capillaries. So here's an example. So we expect um, the, the red blood cells should look like this, but when they try, this is a piece of muscle tissue, and you can see the capillaries here, and I'm going to show in the video these red blood cells going through. So they have to sort of squinch down to get through, right? And that, oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that gives me a chance. Oh yeah, much better. Okay, so you see they're, they're squeezed, which requires energy, obviously, to, in order to, to squeeze them. And you can look at the video. So you can see they squeeze down. This guy's having a hard time getting, getting through. And so the question is, well, is there something extra that's involved besides the heart. And by the way, you see this is not synchronous with the heartbeat. It seems to be disconnected from the, the heartbeat. And uh, you know, I wouldn't have suggested this except you just saw the experiment. We had a hollow tube, just like a capillary, in water. And I showed you that the radiant energy that's coming in, the light energy could drive flow. And so the question is, might the radiant energy help to drive blood flow in your capillaries? And we don't know the answer to that. Uh, we're studying it right now. However, um, there's one experiment that, that bears on, on this, and that is uh, by an Israeli group. Uh, and they were using a technique called optical coherence tomography to look at blood flow in single capillaries. It's a powerful optical technique that gives you a good resolution. So they were studying mice. And these mice, they did whatever experiment they were doing, and then they sacrificed the mouse by clamping the aorta. And the mouse duly responded by perishing. <laughs> okay. However, you know, they had this gadget, and they're, they're measuring blood flow. I think it was the cheek of the, of the mouse. And they noticed that even though the mouse was dead, the blood was still flowing. And they found that the blood continued to flow for more than an hour. So they thought there was some fluke in the experiment, and they repeated the experiment 10 times, and they got the same result. It changed their direction of research because, you know, what's going on? Well, the technique they use, optical coherent tomography, re involves light coming in and using the properties of that light to, to, to image the capillaries and measure flow. The question is, is the light powering the blood flow? And so there is actually a lot of indirect evidence that you, use absorb light to help the heart to push the flow through your capillaries. Now what about cells in general besides uh, capillaries? Well, um, you know, so uh, the cell has, uh, this, this is not a good representation because it looks like the cell has a few macromolecules scattered around. In fact, it's tremendously dense with all kinds of macromolecules leaving very small spaces for the water. But all the water, essentially, almost all the water is right next to one of these molecules, so it's EZ water. The cell is basically filled with, with EZ water. All of your cells are filled with this stuff, full of EZ water. And essentially, yeah, mostly. 
Now, remember, I mentioned that the EZ water was negatively charged. Your cell is negatively charged also, and so uh, a, a very simple, again, no rocket scientist required is, well, I mean, if the cell is filled with negative stuff, then you'd expect the cell to be negative. And cells have been known to be negative now for 60 or 70 years. Lots of measurements show this. Now, the usual interpretation is that this has something to do with the membrane and pumps of ions and such. For, there are many reasons why I believe that's erroneous. And the simpler explanation is the cell is negative because the water inside is negative. It turns out that sick cells are less negative. Uh, cancer cells, for example, typically instead of 80 or 90 millivolts negative, only 10 or 15 millivolts negative. Pathological kidney cells, again, the same sort of thing. And so it comes to the hypothesis, whoops, hypothesis that, um, that the reason these cells are less negative is they're poorly hydrated and that all you need to do basically is drink a lot of water or somehow build easy water in your cells to bring the level of hydration up, bring the charge up, and allow these cells to perform in, in their physiological way. The, the cell function is based on the proteins folding in some way. Proteins normally fold with this kind of water around them. If they don't have the water around them, the situation is abnormal. They can't do their job, and therefore your cell is not functioning, either your kidney cell or your heart cells or your muscle cells or your brain cells, whatever, you need to hydrate. And I think many of you know that there's enormous evidence that hydration is so critical for, for health. And um, so I think this is kind of representative of that. And, and, and then, so uh, the question is, uh, very often we feel good. Uh, for example, if we bathe in the sauna, there's one in the hotel, 20 minutes, you walk in feeling miserable, headache, depressed, uh, muscle ache and you, you sit there for 20 or 30 minutes and you come out feeling like a new person. So why is that? Well, so we normally we'd say it, maybe it's some kind of psychological effect. However, the radiant energy from the heat is infrared energy. Your body is absorbing infrared energy. I showed you that infrared light or energy is the main ingredient necessary for building up this kind of easy water. So I believe the reason you feel good is that your, that this or this or this is actually, or light, in, uh, visible light, is building up this easy water and restoring the water to its natural state, restoring the charge to its natural state. And that's the reason why I think light can work so effectively at different wavelengths. Uh, builds easy and negative charge, enhances function and such. So I'm not suggesting that we, that we photosynthesize the way plants photosynthesize, but the evidence I've shown you suggests that light is critical for our very existence, that we absorb the light, and this light, uh, infrared the most effectively, but all wavelengths, builds this kind of uh, easy water, charge separation, gives us potential energy, gives us energy uh, for function. Last few slides is, you know, we all need these days to show practical applications if this is not a practical enough. And, and one of them that we're working on is, is um, getting, actually we have a couple of patents on some of this stuff, haven't, uh, is, is getting energy from sunlight and water. And so we have negative charge and positive charge here. I've shown you that we can get energy out if we put one electrode here and one here. And recently, we've demonstrated it uh, using multiple cells similar to the chambers that I've, I've shown you. And uh, you can't see it very well, but actually, we can illuminate. Uh, you can light an LED. We can get at least one milliwatt or more out of this so far. So it really is an effective way to generate electrical energy from light. And now I know there are many solar cells that do this, but this is built on water. It's not necessarily to despoil the earth by taking its natural resources. So this is a real positive. And the other, the second one is getting drinking water from contaminated water. So we have a device that we, we built, and it looks, looks like this. So you put flow, and this may contain water plus junk, whatever junk you, you like. We use microspheres as representative junk. And what happens is when you put it into a Nafion tube, you get an exclusion zone, no junk, no junk. All the junk is here. We built a collector 
the central port collects the junk and gets rid of it, but these peripheral regions contain EZ. And so you can see uh, this, I don't know if you can see it well because of the lighting, but we've been able to separate microspheres in one pass-through at a ratio of 200 to 1. So it's a very effective. And um, most exciting is, is salt. We think we can separate salt in this way. And if we can, this is preliminary, we have some preliminary evidence, then it's possible to take ocean water and desalinate uh, ocean using the energy from the sun, not energy from, yeah, so it could be very good for Israeli uh, use and, and other places like California. So we're working on that right now. And so I want to end with some conclusions. And um, the, I guess the fundamental conclusion is, is that water has not three phases, but actually is a fourth phase. And the fourth phase is so critical for understanding so many features. Uh, I've just begun to, to mention a few of them. And I put this fourth phase between the ice and the water because remember, its structure is not so different from ice. In fact, we have evidence that if you want to freeze water to go from here to here, you must pass through this phase. And if you, want to, if you melt ice, you must pass through this phase in order to get to this. So if you start with glacial, a gl melting glacier, you'll have this first, and then it gives rise to, to this. That's why I, I put it there. And the applications of this, or implications, are, are really important. So for, for this group, I think the most important is that light, radiant energy, is absorbed by water, and you're full of water. So light and you are, you know, the, the linkage is, is amazing. It's, uh, it's really a tight linkage. And, and from here, there are so many implications. Uh, one is all kinds of biological implications of this absorption of energy, chemical implications, because if you want to understand or interpret a reaction that involves liquids, especially water, you, you, the, what I've presented to you, if it's correct, is indispensable. Um, in terms of weather, um, most of the predictions of weather have to do with barometric pressure and temperature. You n almost never hear the word charge mentioned, yet the clouds are full of charge. The earth is charged. Uh, in order to understand weather, I think the central variable is not barometric pressure and temperature, it's charge. Next book is uh, going to be dealing uh, with that. But water is centrally involved, and of course, light. Uh, for health, I've already mentioned uh, a few aspects uh, of, of that. The cells requiring light or light helping. Food, if you want to preserve food, you need to know something about the water. If you want to dehydrate or freeze, you need to know what's involved in dehydration and freezing. And some very practical applications like filtering without a filter. The filtration comes from the separation that occurs naturally. You don't need a filter, physical filter that you have to clean or throw away, possibly desalination and also getting electricity. So I want to end actually with this slide, which doesn't summarize anything, but I want to tell you that we're just organizing an institute. It's called the Institute for Venture Science, Venture Science. And we're going to be, with this, funding promising ideas that challenge conventional thinking. This is the URL. It's just coming together right now, and we hope that this will be uh, seriously in existence, funded privately, um, over the next year or so. And we'll be actively looking for people who are doing something that challenges convention, but having difficulty getting support. OK, and finally, finally, is the last slide is a book. That, and, and what I presented to you is a small fraction of what's in the book. And um, uh, there are copies, a limited number of copies outside. Actually, it's cheaper than <laughs> the usual places. So anyway, if you're interested, uh, there's a lot. And also, the previous book, I showed you a picture. There are also a few copies of that out there. So if you're interested, I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.
thank you. <laughs> I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> yeah. No. No. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, we have. Uh, we haven't looked as extensively as, as we'd like. All wavelengths build easy water. I, I didn't go into detail about, uh, uh, we published it. Uh, it's just that the three, three micrometer light uh, that is in, in, in the uh, infrared is particularly effective at doing it. But if you take a red light or a green light or even, even blue light, it, it does. Ultraviolet light seems not able from our studies, not able to build the easy. However, there's other evidence which I didn't, pre didn't, didn't present, which shows that infrared light, particularly at 270 nanometers, I remember I, I mentioned 270 nanometers absorbed by the EZ. So, so that phase of water likes to absorb 270 nanometers. So if you give it 270 nanometers, it's being absorbed in the EZ. And the evidence we have so far suggests that if you have a fully grown EZ and you add ultraviolet light, it increases the charge separation. You see, so, so if the charges are important, and I think they are for, for everything, uh, the, the negative charge is essentially what runs your body. <laughs> I, I mean, I think it's not ATP, but those charges that are responsible for so much, no time to go into it. Um, but, uh, but, but yeah, so in some cases, the UV should be particularly effective uh, in, in, in many applications. We've never, never studied combinations of wavelengths. However, you know, in terms of information, which I, I, I didn't talk about, the EZ is sort of like, almost like a computer memory. It's a discrete array of oxygens, you know, three-dimensional array, but what's a computer uh, memory, it's, it's essentially the same, a, a discrete three-dimensional array. So if the computer memory has the capacity to, to carry information, each entity is a zero or a one, same thing occurs with the EZ. It has the capacity to store information. We're just beginning ourselves now to study the possibility of information storage in water, but some of you may know that the evidence for this is voluminous, and at our water conference each year, we each, each time we have four or five people who present evidence for information storage in, in water. So this is real, and we're basically water. More than 99% of the molecules, if you count fractions of molecules, are water molecules because they're so small. To make up that two-thirds, you need a lot of water molecules. So, you know, current biology looks at water as merely the background carrier of the more important molecules of life. But the evidence that we presented and that people knew 50, 60, 70 years ago is that water is central for everything. And water absorbs light. So water, light, this is, this is what's central to everything. OK, please. <laughs> Good question. Uh, maybe God? <laughs> uh, no, we, so we put the tube in the water, and you know, half the time it goes this way, and the other half it goes this way. It, well, no, it's not random. It's just that we don't know the, we sort of begin to know the answer, but we don't know for sure. If everything is symmetrical, you should get no flow, right? So you need some asymmetry. Well, you know, if we put it here, the light that's coming in from here is more than the light that's coming in from there. So that is certainly one factor that may help determine the particular direction. The, the re I didn't show slides because I didn't have time, but I, I think what's going on is that in the central, if you have the tube, you have an EZ annulus that's just inside the tube. It's negatively charged. And right at the core is the H2O, and that's positively charged. And so along the axis, the central axis of the tube, are a lot of protons that begin to build up. They want to get out. 
so there are no protons outside, so they'll either go this way or this way, wherever the gradient is the biggest. And that gradient could depend on whether the light's coming from here or there. It could depend on when you cut the tube, the tube kind of squinches down, not the same on both sides. The only real evidence we have is when we take tapered tubes, uh, which we've been able to create, it always goes out the small end. And then as it goes out, it pulls in new water, which then gets protonated, and it just keeps going. So uh, that's not a good answer to your question. The answer is we haven't studied it enough to be sure. Yep. As a, a corollary to that question, uh, you, you mentioned in passing uh, it, it slows down or stops after an hour, but there are ways to make that more or less continuous. Yeah. What uh, well, the, uh, see, see, we found in experiments that the reason it slows down is those protons that are created fill the chamber. Eventually, you start with no, well, essentially no free protons, and you wind up, as this process continues, all those protons begin to fill the chamber. When there are too many of them, there's no gradient anymore between the inside of the tube and, and the chamber. So it slows down and then it stops. So all we need to do is use a big chamber. The bigger the chamber, that's all. And it keeps going. It's not very complicated. It's no rocket science. <laughs> Pardon? Oh yeah, that will, that will do it. And, no, and this stuff is actually could be used for propulsion. We've demonstrated that. Yeah. Sure, yeah, and that's, that's, I think, one of the reasons why the, the, the blood is not going, <laughs> going backwards. It goes forwards most of the time, thankfully. <laughs> uh, please. Well, I just had to be on this uh, information paradigm. Good. Um, information, uh, the computer image implies uh, zero or minus, uh, and human culture starts when you get over this plus minus. Oh, that's a difficult question to, to answer. Um, you know, um, yeah, so some of us don't think in terms of black and white thinking. Um, there are certain nuances. Uh, I, I really can't respond properly to your question, although there are some people in the audience who, who could do a much better job than I can. I just want to say that the oxygens, uh, there are some nuances that, that could occur. The oxygens actually have oxidation states from minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two. So each one of those oxygens could change any one of those oxidation states. So the capacity of this to store information is maybe more subtle, shall we say, than in a computer memory, which just has two, zero, one. That doesn't really answer your question. Um, your question is a deep one, and I, I, I really don't have a, uh, a, a good answer to it. There's, there's evidence that information is, is, which you know better than I do, I think, is stored all over. It's not just necessarily in our brains, in, in our water, in the cells of our water, but there's information out there. If you know the work of Rupert Sheldrake, then you know very well what I'm, what I'm talking about. So these are unknowns that, um, we're you know, beginning to start to contribute in, in some way, but I think they're real. And in terms of cells, the information of cell, in cells is very important. You, I'm not sure if you know the work of Luc Montagnier, who comes to our meetings all the time. You know, he won the Nobel Prize for H, discovering HIV. He's studying water, information. He takes DNA uh, and puts it next to water. The two don't touch each other, information, he says, from the DNA, actually from the water surrounding the DNA, gets into the next container, which is just water. And then he uses this water, adds it to the chemicals that are necessary to make new DNA. And the sequence of the new DNA is same as the sequence <laughs> of, of the DNA next, sitting next to the water. So the water has apparently gotten information 
And, and that information can be used to create new DNA. And that has enormous implications for, for us because the information that's in our various cells may be very critical to, to our existence and to our health. So this is the future. It's the frontier. And right now, not much is known. And most people will say, information in water, this is the biggest nonsense I ever heard of. Uh, some of you know that Jacques Benveniste, who started this, got crucified for it, lost his career. It went from a laboratory of 50 to a laboratory of zero practically overnight when he was accused of demonstrating water memory, accused, in fact, by world's greatest magician, uh, the amazing Randy. <laughs> OK, it's a long story, but uh, there's been, uh, but there is one important point to make. I know time is, 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 is running, that a lot of people are, are not willing to study water. They're not willing to put their toe in the, in the water because water has had a precarious history. There are two debacles that took place that made ordinary scientists greatly reluctant to study water. And the first one is the polywater scandal or debacle that took place. The Russians found that if they put water into a thin capillary tube, its properties changed enormously. And some people showed that that was not, that was an error because the water actually was absorbing some of the silica in the surrounding capillary tube. And, and, uh, and then some other people took, uh, and, and therefore, you know, it looked like a silica gel instead of pure water. And some people put salt in the water, and they found that the spectra that they measured, the Raman spectra, were very similar to what the Russians had reported. So they said, oh, the Russians must have been sweating in their water. <laughs> yeah. And so, so this was the first debacle, the poly, so-called polywater debacle, that made it very made scientists highly reluctant to study water. Even though before then, lots of people studied it, because the person who was involved, the Russian who was involved, was Boris Deryagin, the premier, foremost physical chemist in all of Russia. If he could screw up so badly, then what about mortals like us? <laughs> you know. So a lot of people, and then just 20 years later, as people started studying water again, then came the debacle of water memory, the one that I just told you about, where th this guy was crucified uh, for, you know, for, for proposing that water has memory. His experiments have been repeated and confirmed numerous times at our water conference. It's just taken as a given that it's correct, even though Nature, the journal Nature, said this is the biggest nonsense that ever existed. You see, so, so what, I, what I meant to say in this rather lengthy answer is that water has had a checkered history. A lot of scientists look very skeptically on any research involving water. So people stay away from it. It's better to study you know, stem cells or something or nanotechnology. It's safer. So that's the message that I will leave you. <laughs> water is taboo. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you.